Late Night Health continues. I'm Mark Allen, along with the insane Daryl Wayne. We're going to take a look at meditation. This is something I've been trying to do more and more. Uh, Daryl, have you tried meditation? I mean, on on occasion when it's, um, you know, it's just been every once in a while when it's been part of a group or part of this radio program or, you know. Right. But on my own or or one-on-one with somebody, no. 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 Well, I've been... Not so much. Not so much. Why? I know that there's lots of benefits to it. And when, you know, TM became popular in the 60s and 70s, it seemed to be complicated. Well... We have a gentleman who has uh, made it easy for everybody. He's written a book called Bliss More, How to Succeed in Meditation Without Really Trying. And Bobby Morris could play the part because he played it on Broadway in How to Succeed. I'm sorry, I I digress. Light, welcome to Late Night Hell. Is meditation really that important for everybody to do? Uh First of all, thanks for having me on, Mark. I really appreciate it. Hey, Daryl. Uh, I, I, I'm obviously biased in yes. that regard. I think that uh, meditation, you know, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a believer that meditation is, is by any means uh, a uh, silver bullet or, you know, a, um, a cure-all for anything. But I think that it's a good foundational uh, habit to form. If, if what you want in life is to live at, a, at your highest level and to make the clearest decisions and to to be able to just and overall do less and accomplish more. We, uh, we have a, a good friend to the program, Swami. And Swami mm-hmm. teaches one-minute meditation techniques. We've, mm-hmm. we're do, you know, we've done that. Robert uh, Clancy has come out with a class uh, on meditation. And you have... Easy meditation, embrace, accept, surrender, yield, very, very clever. But you've really come up with a hack to make it easy for us. Is that the bottom line here? Well, you know what's interesting is that the, the hack itself is very simple. It's, it's basically instructing the meditator to do the exact opposite of what we've all been conditioned to do when we sit down to meditate for the first, second, or third time, which is to reject or resist our thinking mind. And you hear the, the, the phrase monkey mind associated with meditation a lot, and this is usually the one thing that people um, describe as the biggest obstacle to their ability to meditate. And what I'm saying with easy, you know, embrace, accept, surrender, and yield is basically to, to treat your mind in a way that you're not resisting it and you're, you're operating with within its natural tendencies and what people generally find is that by reconditioning themselves to, to reframe the thinking experience away from being a bad thing to actually being an asset to the to the practice they end up having a more settled mind experiences which is at the end of the day what everybody everybody really wants with meditation well I talk to many people and when they meditate, especially as they begin meditation, they start their meditation and it says, oh, I should pay the telephone bill, the gas bill. Right. And then they go back to watching the light, then, mm-hmm. so to speak. And then yeah. they, they, oh my gosh, I'm late on my car payment. Uh, where's the money coming for rent? I mean, all of these different things pop into your mind. How do you clear that garbage out? Okay, so you, you, you look at it you look at it as one layer of the process. So usually when we sit down to meditate, no matter who you are, no matter what you've been trained in, no matter how long you've been practicing, the first layer of meditation is gonna be the to do list thoughts and the I have to pay my bills thoughts and you know, whatever's happening in your current life thoughts. And here's the the irony is the the extent to which you can look at that not as garbage per se, but as just a part of the process is the extent to which you will be able to go beyond those those thoughts. It's the same thing as going to the gym. You know, you, no one's going to expect anyone who's never worked out before to do 10 pull-ups. But a part of that process is you're going to be in a little bit of muscle soreness. You know, it's going to be kind of challenging. But the more you stay consistent with just practicing and staying process-oriented instead of outcome-oriented, before you know it, you're going to be able to do those 
those 10 pull-ups, and then the, the demand of doing one or two pull-ups is not going to seem like it's very challenging. Whereas well, uh, in the beginning days, just doing one or two was the most challenging thing. So but at the same fun. time, when you're doing this, I mean, <laughs> you're getting the equivalent of, of, a, of a mind headache? Because no, no, you no, no, can't? No, no, no. Just, just seeing the mind as, as bad or seeing thoughts as, as incorrect is the equivalent of muscle soreness. I because see. A lot of times people work out and they, they think, oh, my God, I'm so sore, I can't even move. They don't realize that you're sore because you haven't been moving for a very long time. So I tell people that you know meditation feels hard, not because the practice itself is hard, but because the habit of not meditating for you know however long you've been on the planet is being broken down, and that's what creates that kind of busy, hectic, monkey mind-like experience. How did light get into meditation? What was the motivation for you to say, I want to meditate? Well, I started practicing yoga back in my uh, in my mid-20s when I was living in New York. I live in Los Angeles now, and I remember being in the gym and seeing these uh, attractive women going into this room. And this is back before yoga was really popular. <laughs> So, I knew you know, it was hormones, for women. I knew it. My, my, my hormones <laughs> got the best of me that night. And next thing I knew, I was in this yoga class. It was my first yoga class. And um, eventually I started going for the yoga and not for so much for the women. <laughs> Although it didn't hurt to be the only guy in the class. No, I'll bet. And, and then eventually, you know, meditation is just a kind of a natural extension from the yoga practice. So I, I became introduced to meditation through yoga and then, um, but struggled with it for a few years and had very, you know, the, the conventional sort of understanding of it, which is that it's a hard thing to do. It's very austere. You need a lot of discipline and commitment. And then I, I actually learned um, meditation with a teacher back in, uh, back in 2003. And that, that's what changed my relationship with the practice. It became something that I was looking forward to doing every day. It felt easy, it felt deep, and I've been doing it every day since then, like clockwork. And, and how long uh, and do you do it for? I do it for about 20 minutes in the morning, and then again uh, for 20 minutes in the in the afternoon or evening. And um, I started teaching it about 11 years ago, and, and so the book is just an extension of what I'm already teaching, mm -hmm. which is just principles of making meditation very easy. Our guest is uh, Light Watkins. Uh, he is the author of Blissmore, How to Succeed in Meditation Without Really Trying. Very clever uh, title. Uh, the book did not arrive in time for me to take a look at it, but I know that I will have an opportunity to do that soon. Yeah, we'll what get you a copy, no problem. Great. Uh, Light, what did you do before meditation, yoga, and um, and working out? So I was actually a yoga teacher for... Um, about four or five years before. Prior to that, I was working in the fashion industry. I was a model in New York City, and that's where I first got into yoga. And prior to that, I worked in advertising for a little bit in Chicago as a junior art director. Got it. And college and all that? or College before that, yep. College in D.C. Grew up in Alabama, uh, oh. Bible Belt. <laughs> so there was not a lot of meditation happening when I was growing up in the South. No, and there probably wasn't a lot of yoga because people don't understand what, what it really is. Yeah, not at all. At no. the same so, time. So those practices, when I, even in New York City where I was living at the time, were very new, and there was no one else that I knew that was practicing them. So that's that's one of the things that made them appealing is that they were just so different, and I, I, I liked being the only guy that I knew of. Uh, practicing those things and introducing other people to them. And, of course, the uh, meeting women is still a, that's, that's a, a good thing. <laughs> it was a happy side effect. It was a desirable side effect. A desirable uh, side effect. I, can, I, I don't really remember because I've been with my wife so long, but um, <laughs> two kids, years, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, what are some of the misconceptions about meditation you you talked about growing up in the in the bi buckle of the bible belt i spent yeah. some time in memphis as a talk show host oh my gosh uh uh you know it's uh it's a different culture it's a different thought process yeah. almost well i would say one of the biggest misconceptions is that meditation is a practice that is for people who have a lot of free time on their hands or for people who are you know pacifists or for people who are um, hippies, and I, in my in my experience, it's the it's the exact opposite. I think meditation is 
most valuable for people who are very busy, who are householders, you know, people with lots of kids, with jobs, with responsibilities. And, and the reason I say that is because those people usually have a lot of other people depending on them, and they can't, they don't have a big, a large margin of error in their decision making. Every decision you make is more crucial uh, because your decisions affect a lot of other people's li- livelihoods. And so meditation, bringing a level of clarity to the mind and to decision making that you wouldn't have otherwise can be very beneficial, not just for you personally, but for everyone else who's around you. And if you have a large circle of influence, then you can have a very big impact through your daily meditation practice. And what about kids? Do you think kids should learn meditation? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that we're, we live in an age now where more younger people are experiencing uh, debilitating levels of anxiety and even depression than ever before. And those mental uh, imbalances have direct links to stress accumulation. And meditation is probably one of the easiest and most effective interventions for uh, releasing stress from the body. And so, you know, um, what I find in my teaching is that kids actually they get the meditation practice better than adults do initially because they don't come into the room with all kinds of preconceived ideas about how their minds are not able to quiet or, you know, standing in their own way. And, and there's so kids, it's, they, they, they also learn languages faster than we can. That's right, well, yeah. So it must be the kind of, same they thing. A, they, have a, they have a more openness and more acceptance of new things than adults tend to. The problem with kids, though, they don't oftentimes have enough uh, stress and demands as adults do, and so they don't appreciate it as much as adults do. When, it, when an adult learns how to meditate, after having gone through all of the trials and tribulations of just living normal life, they have a far greater appreciation for the peace that they can find within than, say, the kid who's only been on the planet for seven or eight years, who hasn't been through as much. I mean, they could still go through a lot, but not as much as someone who's 48 years old. Exactly. Do you have kids of your own? Not yet. No, not yet, but I'm looking forward to having kids one day soon. All right. If you want to, uh, you know, borrow some, I can I can arrange that. <laughs> uh, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, hey, any, anything for a friend. Uh, Light yeah. Watkins is our, uh, our guest. He's also uh, done TEDx Talks, has garnered hundreds of thousands of views, and um, is the founder of the Shine Movement, a global movement with a mission to inspire. Uh, we've enjoyed uh, our our little brief chat. Maybe we'll do it again once I get the book, and we'll uh, we'll try to do it again in a month or so. How's that? That sounds great to me, Mark. Thank okay. you so much. I really hey, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Light Watkins, our guest here. Well, guess who's coming up next? Guess, guess, guess. Uh, Robert uh, Clancy. Oh, you knew. You didn't guess. You knew. You looked at the schedule. That's why they call it a cheat sheet. Aha. Well, Robert Clancy will be joining us uh, in a couple of moments, uh, uh, talking to us about motivation and how to find it. Uh, I'm Mark Allen. This is Late Night Health. Join us at LateNightHealth.com. LateNightHealth.com. Change can be disruptive, but only if you allow it to be. Great renewal is always born from change. If you find that your life hasn't been a smooth sail, know the winds of change will eventually take you to a peaceful shore. There will always be setbacks, but they're never permanent. The sun will rise again, and the weather will always clear after a storm. Let your smile be a great reminder of your blessings. It's time to set your sights on a new goal and persevere. The great goal is to love. So simply, love. For more inspiration from Robert Clancy, visit GuideToTheSoul.com or go to the Moments with Robert page on LateNightHealth.com.
Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The tax doctor is here to help you negotiate a lower tax bill. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts. But you can stop these IRS actions. The tax doctor will fight for you using industry secrets that can stop any IRS actions, eliminate penalties and interest, and reduce your past tax bill so you pay the IRS less. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, call the tax doctor now for a free IRS audit emergency review. 800-663-5107. 800-663-5107. 800-663-5107. That's 800-663-5107. 